Deborah, back in 1986, you would have been a young buck, dare I say, a young actress. Uh, uh, a getting young to... lass, a young lass, isn't that a how we say lass. it? A young lass, a young lass, a young dame, a young dame should be young there. Young dame, all right. Yeah, yeah, a young dame. Getting to know the industry, getting to know uh, the business of uh, Hollywood and uh, the leading lights. And uh, dare I say, uh, season five of the A-Team. This is not season one. This is season two. This is not season three. A-Team, at the height of its powers, one of the biggest cable TV shows across America, USA. Legendary stars like George Papar, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, Dirk Benedict, Starbuck uh, in Battlestar Galactica, Mr. T, The Bigger Than Life, Ego. And as a young actress in your early 20s, I imagine, uh, yes. to to be cast in to a, a guest role in the A-Team, was it almost like scratching your eyes and daydreaming <laughs> in terms of saying, wow, is this what Hollywood life is going to be like? Uh, and is, is this what's in store for me going forward? Right. Well, I must say that it was a bit of a whirlwind for me because it was my very first job in Los Angeles. Very first? Yes, it was. I wow. had gone to North I'd gone to Northwestern University in Chicago, which was a great school, a great theater school. I studied music and drama. Then I did some professional theater in Chicago for a time, for about a year or so. But I had this itch to sort of spread my wings. So I moved to Los Angeles. I had a very good agent, uh, Innovative Artists. So my first audition was literally for the A-Team. Wow. And it was in person, of course, because back then we didn't do so much on Zoom. Yes. Video. Um, but I remember thinking, oh, this feels good. But being there on set for the first day was a lot to sort of assimilate because um, again, my experience was more on, you know, on the stage and I had done one national McDonald's commercial and suddenly I'm thrust into this world and I'm meeting Mr. T and Dirk Benedict and George Papard. I remember getting in, you know, my sort of blazer because I'm playing the tour guide uh, makeup, but I remember us having one rehearsal that it was one rehearsal and then it was lights, camera, action. And in the world of theater, you know, you rehearse for six weeks. So it was a lot to assimilate, just the excitement of meeting all the stars, but also, you know, doing the work uh, in a different context, uh, you know, hitting your mark and all these things. But it was a fantastic first experience. I'm so thankful and grateful for it. Um, you know, I didn't realize at the time, you know, like, like you said, the late David McCollum and and Mr. T was such an icon and really such a kind man behind the scenes. You would, you know, maybe be surprised by who he really, uh, he really was. But it was a great, great first experience. I'm so thankful for it. And Deborah, dare I say, obviously, we know the industry as such uh, in terms of going up for these roles in Utah, audition for roles. It's not like you walked into a room where it's you against three other people. There was probably a hundred or more actresses going for this sort of uh, role, given what it could do for their careers in terms of having a credit on the A-team, could open doors, could open opportunities. Uh, dare I say... Uh, did it take from the moment you auditioned to the moment you got that call saying that, yes, you're going to appear on that? Was it a drawn out process or was such was the demand that they needed someone, dare I say, to, to go straight in that it was a fairly quick turnaround? Honestly, uh, you know, television tends to move quickly. Uh, there's usually a date when they're going to film something. So I remember the process being fairly swift, yeah. that the audition happened and then it was maybe, oh, maybe four days later that we were filming. But what was interesting is that, again, this was my first credit. Uh, so it catapulted me to my next job. And my next job was a more sizable role. Uh, so it was nice to have this first credit on my resume. I was grateful for it. Yeah, and I suppose the first credit uh, where you can list yourself alongside uh, George Papard, a uh, Hollywood icon, uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's, uh, sort of uh, probably a favourite actor of your own father and mother, dare I say, uh, in terms of your family, uh, must obviously probably grew up watching uh, George Papard uh, movies uh, in, in terms of that. So obviously when you were told family, friends, loved ones that you're going to be appearing for your first 
live TV performance on the A team of all sorts of shows. Uh, it must have gone down to a real sort of a uh, treat at home. To yes, our daughter is going to make it, and our daughter is going to be uh, the the next sensation. She's starting off with the A team, nonetheless. <laughs> Right. I think my father was so good. She's going to be able to pay her rent. Thank you, God. Um, but, you know, then, I, you know, my siblings were just like, oh, how fun. When is it going to air? You know, and make sure the family is sitting down to watch. Uh, but it's fun to be on a show that that was so successful and so popular and brings so much joy and entertainment to everybody's households. It's it's a fun job. You know, it's a it's a gift of a job, I think. And Deborah. I know, obviously, as a young actress, and you were only a young actress at the time, barely out of your teens, that you probably mightn't have had more, you probably had engaging conversations with some of the stars and maybe might be in terms of lighter type of conversations. But I spoke to some actors and actresses and they said, particularly around season five, they noticed a change in George Papard uh, in terms of his, this was his final season that maybe that uh, his mood, his form offset when he was shooting, that he wasn't in the sort of jovial type of move, that things weren't the same, that you could tell that maybe something was going on in the background that was disturbing him. Did you any get any vibes like that or did you not have the opportunity to spend any sort of time with George or have a conversation with George? You know, I, rem I recall meeting him uh, but I do wish that I had more time. Um, if I had, I probably would have asked him about Audrey Hepburn. Um, but I do recall that, you know, time is money and everything is very expensive when you're filming a television series or a film. Um, so it was very much getting the job done. And I think for any actor, when you're in season five, uh, it's a drumbeat. It's, it's a lot. It's exhausting. It can be very exhausting work. The hours are exhausting. So if he seemed a bit more, a little bit less jovial, I I can respect that. I can appreciate how he might have been feeling. Uh, but I can't say that I had any experience with him, you know, giving sort of any negative energy. I can't, yeah. I can't recall that. Yeah, because a good lot of people have mixed stories to tell about George. Everyone seems to have good stories to say about Mr. T, good story, really good stories to say about Dwight uh, Schultz in terms of how very much of a nice man he really was who played Murdoch, uh, one of the most lovable, friendliest people, people would meet. And Dirk Din is quite the opposite of the character he plays on screen. He's quite a quite reserved sort of a man, uh, uh, Dirk uh, Benedict. But the stories of George are sort of mixed in, in terms of the good, the bad and the ugly. But in terms of your own experiences, did you have, you mentioned there about Mr. T, you seem to have uh, fond memories of uh, meeting T uh, from, from your interactions there. Was he the one that struck the most impression on you? So, you know, he carries such a big persona. Uh, and so to be sitting there in the makeup trailer as a young actress assimilating all of this and having him walk in and being just so approachable and so himself with his full regalia, you know, it, it he disarms you and um, surprises you with his warmth. Uh, you know, it wasn't until later, honestly, James, that I realized that he was so about doing good. He was so about uh, speaking into children's young people's lives. Uh, to make the best of, of what they had. And then, so I, I think I grew an appreciation for him, honestly. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose, Deborah, let's talk a, about your scene. It's sort of pandemonium. It's almost like you're in a park going forth, back and forth in a trolley, up and down, over and back. And dare I say, it's cutting in between sort of scenes, uh, the camera flicking to sort of fight scenes and sort of uh, sort of fight reactions between David and Robert and George and sort of stuff like that. So dare I say, it must have been a crazy sort of loft when that sort of shooting was going on in terms of having your eyes in the back of your head because I imagine there was so much going on around you as a young actress to try and keep your own focus and attention. Obviously, these shoots cost money as well in terms of takes, in terms of that. So dare I say, a slip of the tongue, a slip of a line. Uh, obviously, a take uh, means that 
dare I say, they have to go back again. They have to shoot more sort of money and time. And you're dealing with seasoned pros here as well that, dare I say, don't want to do many sort of takes. So was it a bit with everything going on and to say guns and glory and everything happening around you, almost like a battlefield? Was it hard to try and stay in the zone, dare I say, and zone yourself out of it and keep to the little task that you had to do, which is a big task yeah. for you, dare I say. But in terms of what everything was going around you, people might have perceived it as a little task. But for you, it was obviously the be all and end all. I think that's a very insightful comment, because I think one of the greatest needs of an actor, particularly in film and TV, is focus. Because I think we as an audience have little appreciation for all that's going on around here when the camera is on you. Um, and plus, I think as a as a guest actor, you're always coming in as, you know, the new kid on the block. And these folks have been around each other, really working as a family. And they're very, very comfortable, very accustomed to each other and how they each other works. So you're really kind of feeling an extra layer, I think, of pressure uh, to do your job well. Um, now, fortunately, again, it was a sizable scene. You know, it wasn't like I was loaded down with tons of dialogue. It was in my wheelhouse. I was prepared. But I do, and I think that the scene does work well because she's, you know, poised and gesturing, you know, uh, they're calmly doing her job while chaos is happening around her. I think that's the kind of the fun of the scene. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose, Deborah, what's so poignant uh, about your sort of scene is when they cut to your scene and the tram going around, the only one speaking is you. The only one that we notice is you in terms of that. So it's almost like it's cut to you, then back to the scene, then back to you, then back to the scene. So audience and viewers, uh, when the main they are saying the main ending is coming to end. The main conclusion to this episode is seen that you're bang in the middle of that. You're bang in the heart of that as well. So you can't be really missed. It's not like, oh, who's that appeared out of the coffee shop and they had that one line and dare I say, you're bang in that sort of conclusion, that sort of epilogue. So that must have been exciting as well where your storylines came about and where you're sort of situated in the episode because you're right in where people want to see the, the climax. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, a very exciting part of the episode for sure. And um, I think that they, I think they crafted it well. Um, I do. I think that, again, the juxtaposition between the chaos and her having to remain uh, in control and composed uh, was fun. It was great fun. And I heard more time, that when, especially when young actors or young actresses came on the set, that uh, particularly Joy uh, Schultz would be very welcoming. He would go and introduce him himself and he'd welcome to the new actors and actresses that came on set, uh, Dwight, who played Murdoch. Did you have that experience? Did Dwight uh, sort of welcome you, say a few words, try and find out a tiny bit about you? I do recall meeting him. And again, his, like you said, his persona being so warm and wanting you to feel comfortable, that makes all the difference for actors. Um, I think about those actors that have... Uh, given me that feeling, you know, like even on Full House, uh, Bob Saget had an amazing ability to be so disarming and, and you know, cracking jokes and, and again, just feeling like America's dad. But Dwight was great. Uh, my exposure to him was not extensive. Again, it was um, more in the in the makeup trailer as we're all getting getting ready. Um, but he was very warm, engaging and, and funny, as yeah. you would suspect. Very intelligent man as well, extremely intelligent, could talk about any sort of thing by all accounts uh, in terms of... And working on a Stephen J. Cannell production, was this your... You mentioned your first sort of credit uh, in terms of producers, directors. Did you get to meet uh, Stephen on set? Did, uh, did Stephen appear? Uh, can you sort of remember? I know it's probably testing the memory, dare I say. Never yet. Um... I would not be surprised if at some point in my career I met him because mm. I did a number of his shows. There was a wonderful series he did, uh, 21 Jump Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of Canada. And I did a wonderful episode with Johnny Depp and uh, Peter DeLuise. And uh, I don't know 
I, I think I did recall meeting him on that production, but I don't believe I did on um, on the A team. Mm -hmm. And Deborah, uh, in terms of being involved in the A team and having credits uh, on the A team, obviously you mentioned you got projects there afterwards and they're probably picked up. But you think maybe looking back and people having that having that credit on their resume, do you think it opened up doors for you? Obviously it did because it opened doors uh, there afterwards. But do you think the way it sort of worked out, having that gig for you, it sort of got you fairly busy, fairly active at, at a young age, uh, obviously having the A-team, that it meant that it opened opportunities probably quicker than they might have come? You know, I think it probably did. What's interesting, James, is again, I was new to Hollywood. I had gone to a good school, which did not hurt me. But literally, I had one credit. It was the A-team. And then my next film, I was playing opposite Ryan O'Neill, along with Isabella Rossellini. Norman Mailer was directing the film. Francis Ford Coppola was one of the producers on the film. And I think they felt more comfortable casting me in a large role because I had a credit. <laughs> I had one National McDonald's commercial and I had the A-team. Yeah. But they trusted. So it, yes, I think it was actually a very important credit. The timing was perfect. Yeah. yeah. And Deborah, in terms of um, guest stars and sort of reoccurring sort of roles, which was the sort of team in the 80s, it sort of started off in that 90s, but it sort of diminished as we went on where an actress and actress might appear for maybe in one series. But dare I say the possibility of coming back again was sort of fairly limited uh, was that a sort of a joyful sort of moment to be an actor and actress in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, where if you did a good success, maybe in a season one of a series, that the opportunity, the directors, producers might come back to you and say, we've got a different character in mind for season four. You might just have to change it up a tiny little bit uh, in terms of appearances, but would you be willing to come back? Because those days sort of diminished, dare I say, as we went into the later 90s and the noughties. Mm. Yes, I think it's always a great a sort of a report card, shall we say, when you've been cast and you've done your job well. And so they actually want to develop your character. That's always like extremely uh, encouraging, right? So when I did Full House, I did three episodes um, opposite Bob Saget, as I mentioned, and they wanted us to get married. They wanted to have a wedding on the show and they wanted to make me a series regular, which I let my agents talk me out of. They thought that I would get lost in the shuffle. They had bigger plans for me. So I let them convince me out of it. But I kind of honestly regret that decision because that would have been a wonderful opportunity. It was a really fun series and well-beloved by um, the United States and beyond. Um, so, you know, you live and learn, right? Uh, but I did a couple episodes. I had a recurring character on uh, In the Heat of the Night, playing opposite Alan Autry, directed by Carol O'Connor. And that, again, was a great series. I uh, did three episodes, and they wanted to do a spinoff series between Bubba and my character, Pat Day. And uh, for whatever reason, I think it was Fred Silverman, it didn't work out. But it's always a great opportunity. It's something you know, that you always hope for as an actor. Um, because, you know, as actors, we're, we're always auditioning. You're always and I love the auditioning, auditioning press process. I do. Um, but to have a bird in the hand is always nice. Yeah. And Deborah, in terms of that appearance on the A-Team, you obviously got to work with sort of scenes with George, with Dirk, with Dwight. Did your pets ever cross with them ever again after that time in the A-Team? Did... Was there ever a, a, a series or a guest role or another sort of series where you bumped crafts or even a, a Hollywood event or a social event where your paths may have, may have crossed, dare I say, even for a brief time in the future? You know, I should do a deeper dive on my career because I cannot imagine that one of those actors did not cross my path again. But nothing that I can think of. Now, if I were to go on my IMDb Pro, I could probably figure out uh, some link of a series that we did together and we didn't put it together. Um, but no, isn't that funny? Mm. I'd yeah. love to say that 
was, but and, and there probably is. Once we get off here, I will probably figure something out, James. Probably. Yeah. And I suppose, uh, Deborah, uh, in terms of uh, the A team, I suppose, in terms of female actresses that have played a role, and in terms of the good and the bad and good actresses, uh, would you have liked to have? Later on in your career as you're older, you've probably played bad characters and good characters. Is there a sense of powerfulness being a sort of, uh, dare I say, a bad egg or a bad cookie in a show like that? Would have that been fun or entertaining for you, dare I say, if you, at that time, if you were a bit older and maybe a wiser kind to play a sort of a bad, a bad, a, a, a bad diva, dare I say? Oh my goodness, I love that, James. I'm actually a fairly nice person <laughs> in real life. But to me, that's one of the joys of acting is putting on somebody else's persona and um, being given the words that maybe you don't have in your own life, but given uh, powerful words. I remember doing a scene from Lady Macbeth in college at Northwestern, I thought, <laughs> out damned spot. It was, it was great. Fun. So I feel honestly very privileged. You know, Full House, I was everybody's mom. You know, I was warm and a good mom to my son. And, and, and that was fun. I was really kind of playing myself. But it's really, I think, almost extra fun to play somebody um, that's potentially manipulative, that's using her wherewithal, her feminine wiles to get what she wants. Um, you know, I played a fun character on Matlock. I feigned my own death and okay. then came back as somebody else. Um, so, I mean, I've had, I feel like I've had a good fortune of playing some really fun, interesting ladies, but I hope there's more to come. Yeah. And I suppose, Deborah, in terms of, uh, we're, we're obviously the businesses, dare I say, we're nearly getting back. Uh, it looks positive uh, in the near future. And uh, dare I say, um, obviously, you're looking ahead to a prosperous uh, 2024. I say we can rule out 2023 with everything that's happened uh, in terms of we can say 2023 has been prosperous, but uh, as prosperous sort of 2024. And do you expect it to be ticking heavy when... 20 January 24 comes around. Is that going to be a fairly hectic year for you? Do you imagine it's going to be lights, camera, action the whole time? Or will you get a chance to venture or travel or with everything that's gone? Or are you just going to be happy if it's lights, camera, action the whole time? <laughs> oh, I will be happy if it's lights, camera, action. I will. Um, I really love what I do. But I also am fairly creative in that I find other things to do and create you know, during this season I have. I was fortunate to work on an independent film that got a early uh, interim agreement. So it was a SAG project that we got permission, so to speak. And it was it's a beautiful film. It'll probably, I wouldn't be surprised if it shows up at Sundance, but it's a beautiful film. So that was really a blessing. Um, but then I also wrote a children's book and I also uh, create uh, travel videos uh, for our Airbnbs. My husband and I own a bunch of tree houses actually in our area and yeah. the town we're near is Darling and people love to visit it. And so I make videos explaining, you know, where to have dinner, where to, what wineries are good, what restaurants, uh, where to shop. So I enjoy other things as well. But I think 2024 is going to be amazing. I have actually, like I mentioned, a really wonderful opportunity for a role uh, just this afternoon. Uh, and it's, it's some, has some very heavy hitters in it, I will say. So it's interesting to see an interim agreement project that is working, going to work soon because it's been approved with some larger names attached to it. So it's exciting. Yeah, I, I really am hopeful and prayerful that all of this will just... Uh, Start booming again soon. And uh, Deborah Stipe, have you ever been to Ireland in your travels uh, throughout the world? I regret to say that no. I worked on a film once in Glasgow, Scotland, and okay. it was extraordinary. It was extraordinary. Um, so close. But no, my husband went on a wonderful golfing trip this last year in Ireland. Okay. And he was so excited to hit every pub that was, you know, within the vicinity of the hotel. And would you believe they played 36 rounds of golf every day and never got to a pub. 
So I said, well, this really means we need to go back because that's just not okay. Okay. So no, I've never been to Ireland. I would like to go. Okay, we'd be more than welcome to have you, uh, Deborah. And uh, Deborah Stipe, uh, maybe for the last 30 seconds now, I'm going to turn it over to you. And you might enlighten our, all, the, all our audience and our listeners what the whole A-Team experience uh, meant for you back in October the 1986. And uh, if you could sum it up into two sentences, what would Deborah Stipe like to summarize her experience on the A-Team? Being on the A-Team was an extraordinary gift to me as a young actress. It provided me my very first credit and also a rich memory of working with some really delightful people. On that note, uh, Deborah Stipe, from me, uh, Jim Conlon, thanks for joining us this evening to share your memories uh, of the tour guide you played on The Say Uncle Affair, Season 5, Episode 6, which aired on October uh, the 31st actually to October the 31st 1986 uh, alongside Robert Bohan, George Prepard, Dirk Benedict, Mr. T, uh, Dwight Schultz, uh, Eddie Velez, Carol Franklin just to name a few. But for the moment for me uh, Jim Conlon to you Deborah Stipe stay safe take care God bless Deborah. Thank you God bless you thank you so much enjoyed it. Cheers Deborah take care. Bye-bye now.